And you focus on the breath and stay with the breath. You're developing good qualities of mind. Mindfulness, alertness. And as you look into the process of breathing as a kind of fabrication, there is a willed and intentional element in there. And because there is an element of will, you can change it. You can find ways of calming it down. This way you give rise to discernment as well. Leading to concentration. These two qualities, discernment and concentration, as they're supported by mindfulness and alertness, bring the mind to greater and greater stillness, greater and greater clarity. So as we're working with the breath, we're not just working with the breath, we're gaining insight into the mind, into the processes of the mind. And this is a very useful and important investment of our time and energy. Sometimes you hear it said that when you meditate you're not supposed to have any sense of gaining or getting anything out of the meditation. But that's simply referring to the impatience we have. You do a little bit of meditation and you want to get lots and lots of results right away. You've got to learn how to put that attitude out of your mind. But there are returns, there are benefits that come from meditation, and it is an investment. And it's an investment in something reliable. These qualities of the mind, they stay with you whether the economy goes up or the economy goes down, whether the body gets healthier, gets sick, when it dies. The qualities you've invested in will stay with the mind. And so given the fact that we have a limited amount of time, limited amount of energy, we want to make sure that we invest our time and energy in the most reliable things. And if you invest in your attachments, you'll find that they give you some support for certain amounts of time, and then they'll start changing on you. As the Buddha said, everything fabricated, that means everything is put together by causes, is inconstant. And if you find yourself latching onto something inconstant, it can give you support only as long as it lasts, and then it's going to change. Even good qualities of the mind are inconstant, but the more you invest in them, they have, they have much more lasting impact, a much more lasting ability to support you all the way through the process of aging, all the way through the process of illness, all through the process of death. These things stay there, and it can help you. Because the body is something you're going to have to let go of, and eventually you're going to have to let go of your memories, your thoughts, everything having to do with this life. And you find, at that point, the irrevocable quality of time really pushes itself on you. In terms of our day-to-day -day life, we tend to live in our narratives, our stories about this person and that person. And the relationships we have with them, the things we've done, and the reassuring quality of a narrative is that you can tell it again and again and again. And it seems to make this constant flow of time, or it seems to put this constant flow of time at bay for a while. But you find as, as things close down with the body, those narratives don't provide any help. In fact, sometimes they make things even worse. The things you're going to miss, the things you're going to regret having done, will come pressing in on you. And you have to learn how to let go. And at that time, if you haven't had any practice in letting go, it's going to be hard. So this is one of the 
forms of investment is learning how to let go, developing that skill. The Buddha talks about different forms of wealth in the mind that you can invest in, in other words, qualities you can develop. I can see you through, and the ability to let go is an important one. Discernment is another one. The Buddha had a very pragmatic approach to truth. As we talk about the truth of our statements, the things that we say, and to what extent can you encompass the truth of an experience in words? Poets struggle with this all the time and are constantly admitting that words are poor. when it comes up to the actual experience of something. Pictures are a poor ex rendition of experience. And you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but it can lie much more than a thousand words, too. What's really real in life are the processes that are happening right here, right now, the way we create words the way we use words, the way we use ideas, and then the impact they have in terms of causing stress and suffering or alleviating stress and suffering. That's a truth. That's a reality. So you want to focus on really getting in touch with that reality. This doesn't mean that words are totally false, but they, they're useful as tools. Again. And the impact they have on the mind is real. You look at the story of the Buddha's awakening. They say they had three knowledges in the course of that night. The first was looking back on his past lifetimes. You think you have narratives to deal with in your life, and you suddenly remember aeons and aeons of narratives. Where he had been, what he had been, his name, his appearance, the food he ate, the pleasure and pains that he would experience in that life, and then how he died, and then moved on to another life, and then another life. But that knowledge wasn't his awakening. And they went on to the second knowledge, which was knowledge of beings dying and being reborn all over the cosmos. In other words, moving from his own personal narrative, he went to a more general look at the cosmos as a whole, so that he wasn't the only one who was going through this process of repeated birth and death. There are many, many beings, all the way from beings in hell, beings up to the various levels of heaven, even Brahmas, in states of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception and non-perception. But they're all dying and being reborn and moving around. But he was able to see there was a general principle. By looking at the cosmos as a whole, the general principle was that people suffered pleasure and pain because of their actions, their intentions, which in turn were determined by their views. If their views were wrong, in other words, if they felt that actions didn't have any impact, it didn't really matter what you did, what you said, what you thought, they were going to suffer because they were going to act on that belief and suffer. If they believed that their actions did have an impact, they were important. It was important that you looked at your intentions and you looked at your actions and the results they gave rise to. You'd experience pleasure. But even seeing that still wasn't reliable. Didn't put an end to his own suffering. But it did give him some clues. Views and intentions are important. And so in the terms of the third knowledge that night, he started looking at his views, looking at his intentions, right in the present moment, seeing them as activities in the mind. So, okay, these intentions lead to suffering, especially intentions that don't understand what suffering is, where it comes from, how it can be ended. Those lead to more suffering.
the views that do understand where suffering comes from lead you to and make the intention of the path to put an end to that suffering based on correct understanding. But you've got to look at the processes here in the present moment. You've got to see them, particularly seeing how craving arises. And how the mind flows with a craving from moment to moment. And Buddha said the way it goes from moment to moment in this lifetime is the way it's going to go from moment to moment from the end of this life to the beginning of the next. So you've got your laboratory right here. We're not concerned with what you are. The concern is with what you do. And you can see that what you are is an extraction, an <clears throat> abstraction. But what you can do is something you can watch right here, right now. And that's something you can always watch if you have the intention and the understanding that helps you realize that this isn't something important to look at. Because most of the time we tend to look at other things. We get wound up in all our other narratives, all our other views which tend to deflect our intention from the present moment. The mind is like a politician. The politician is doing his dirty work, but he keeps pointing out, those other people are horrible. Look at what those horrible things those other people are doing. But if we keep looking right here, right here, right here, staying with the breath, because the breath is the closest thing to the mind. You begin to see the movements of the mind and see how they cause suffering and how they can put an end to suffering. That understanding is real. That process is something you really see and it really happens. That's something you know for sure. William James, the philosopher, talks about it's called the pragmatic approach to truth, realizing that the truth of a statement is only approximate. But watching the, the mind in the process of creating a statement, watching in the process of creating any of its views about reality, you see that it really does have an impact. So the, the statement, even though it may be an approximate truth, does lead to a certain type of action, and the action leads to a certain type of result, which you can experience directly. That process is a truth of a different order. And so you find it's important that you learn how to develop the ideas that lead to an end of suffering, that will lead you to act in ways that put an end to suffering. And if you find any idea that leads to more suffering, more ignorance, more craving, you don't have to hold on to it. You can let it go. And so as we're sitting here, trying to stay focused on the breath and noticing when the mind wanders off, that ability to drop a thought mid-sentence, drop the thought with, even when it's all loose ends, that's an important ability, that's an important skill. You catch yourself in the middle of creating a little reality there, and you can come back having your frame of reference in the present moment. You get more and more skillful letting go, more and more skillful at catching yourself in these various processes more and more quickly, and getting a deeper understanding of why you go for these things. Those are skills that are going to stand you in good stead. Those are good skills to invest in. Because we have the time every day to you know, make the time. The time doesn't going to happen on its own. You have to make the time to practice, create the time to practice, open that space in your life. So you can invest that time in the skills that are really going to be helpful all the way through. Because suffering is real. 
but the end of suffering is also real. It's got the time spent investing in understanding these things, mastering the skills for putting an end to suffering. That's time well spent. You suffer less, the people around you suffer less as well. As you go through the process of aging, illness, and death, if you can manage your mind, the other problems that come up are going to be minor. So this is the Buddha's investment strategy. Invest in good qualities of the mind. Develop a mind that you can trust, not to go flailing around when things get difficult. That's the wisest investment of all.